Excellent. So how do we typically start um, the process for a project? Uh, it'll be through CAD. Uh, we typically ask everybody in our firm to give us a CAD drawing. It doesn't always the case, but, um, and then from there, and I have a video that I can share on that, on how this process works. First, I'll show you what we do. So in this case, you know, there's, I get a CAD file and it might look like this. <laughs> Not atypical. And nothing too crazy. I mean, it's got the contours and everything that it needs in there, but it's not ideal. So what we end up doing a lot of the time is we'll go in into CAD and we'll clean up the file before we import it in. And all I want is really the print information that I need. Let's see what this one is. The pertinent information that I need to actually import that I'm gonna model. So what are you actually gonna model is really what you want in your imported CAD file. So there it is, it imports in, I have to explode it. And then again, like we use a lot of extensions and that's hopefully gonna change in the way that SketchUp runs in the future in terms of having more of these kinds of tools um, integrated directly into it. And I'm going to talk about extensions after this portion so everybody understands what they are. I mean, SketchUp's basically like an iPhone or a tablet, and you need to use apps to make it work right, um, or at least efficiently. So one extension we have is the Dynascape tools. It's a CAD cleanup script. And what it does is, is it will automatically go through the CAD line work and clean it up for the most part. If I didn't do it this way, what I'd have to do is go in here and do this manually, which, yeah, there's times we'll bill in the hours to do this, um, but it's not ideal because it can take a lot of time, you know, just to get that little portion. And I've been doing this for so long, I understand how, you know, SketchUp functions in the way that it, creates this way so that it's not efficient. So the CAD cleanup script, what it really does is, and if you want this script again, it, it's not easy to get. So I can share that with you all, just let me know. Um, but I'll run CAD cleanup on it and it will process it out. It doesn't do everything. You still need to go in there sometimes and clean it up a little bit. And that can be its own little nuance. Like in this case, that little nub of an edge is actually preventing that surface from being healed. I have some other tools. Don't look at behind the screen just yet for other tools that will help here at least clean up. This one's an old one, um, but I bet you it deletes everything that is preventing it from creating surfaces or it freezes to death. Um, you get the idea. So that's right there is the really the heart of the process for us in terms of, I'm gonna run it again. You can run this as many times as you want. Let's see if it cleans it up. So that's step one. Take the time and clean up the AutoCAD file. Um, you know, here, everything's now single surface. Then before you do anything else, you start applying textures. Don't extrude anything. If you, if you take a surface, oops, and extrude it, and now you want to put a texture on it, you have to do it on all different sides versus if you just put it on first, it'll actually carry it over. So before we do anything else, we'll go in there and we'll put the surfaces down. Oh, that's a little wrong. Didn't like that but we're not gonna fix that right now. You know, whatever it might be that you need to do here, um, but it doesn't take long. And really 
at the heart of site design, unless you're working on terrain, it's really just getting the rest of the stuff in here. So for example, you know, here's an example of a site plan started from CAD, we graded it. This is a memorial called Welcome Home Soldier. Um, and, you know, everything started from a CAD file here on some level and then got either pushed up, you know, another site like this one. And just, it's really tends to be very flat oriented sites. So you're not dealing with a lot, if you're not doing a lot of terrain work and if you we're first starting out with SketchUp, I would say you don't want to do a lot of terrain work initially. Um, learn how to model on a flat surface um, and that'll just be more efficient for you in terms of like really just what is, what is this model that you're looking at here? It's, it's flat. It came from CAD um, and we put in some terrain, like there's Soapskin Bubble, which I'll show you some terrain modeling tools here towards the end. Um, just got the styles on. Let's go turn those off. There we go, better. Um, and then from there, what we do with something like this is we, we take it into Lumion um, and from Lumion, uh, we will actually add all our trees, all our vegetation, um, do all of our entouraging and our effects. Um, we'll talk about Lumion here as well, because extensions, terrain modeling, and Lumion is where I want to take you all. And we'll talk about why we use Lumion internally, because we've been using Lumion for 12 years, but that's not the only rendering program we use. So going back to this, the CAD portion of all this is fairly important. Um, let me see if I have... I don't know where that would be. Uh, find this. This one's buried. Uh, I might have to find this link for you, but it explains the process um, in specific details, but it's from a very old um, approach. If not, my book, SketchUp for Site Design, um, does have a chapter on modeling directly from CAD into SketchUp, but I would love to find the video here for you, but I can't, so my apologies for that. I do have other videos online at YouTube for all free that go over a lot of this stuff as well, just so you know. Um, so either way, the, the stuff's out there, but you know, the heart of it is then working with CAD and then from CAD um, working with Lumion. Let's talk about extensions. So there is an extension warehouse. Hopefully this works. Yep, yeah, it'll work, thank you. Not gonna make me sign in. No, perfect. So this is where you can get the custom tools for SketchUp. Um, you know, for example, there's one called SoapSkin, which I go over in various tutorials and it's also for train modeling. But there's just a whole bunch of other extensions. If, when you go to my website, if you download, if you sign up, you'll get a PDF with some recommended extensions that we use. Um, for example, like there's Path Copy, um, which I think is still on here. There's Path Copy, which lets you array things along arcs or multiple arcs. Um, tons of different stuff. Like there's another one, uh, a randomizer for vegetation to make more natural looking habit. Um, again, here, this one, I know where it is. Thank God for YouTube at times. So this is a website, I'll, this is a YouTube channel, or sorry. This is a presentation from Basecamp that goes over extensions. It's an oldie and it's a goodie. It's one of my more favorite presentations and it really goes over you know, the various aspects of using extensions. Um, so you do want to get familiar with it, no matter what level, no matter what level of SketchUp you're at, like use an extension. Um, and because they make a lot of differences, I mean, I'll show you another extension that we use fairly often. And this one's, um, this one lets me make fences. So I can pick from all these settings, these predetermined 
fencings, objects, whatever they might be. And then it'll let me just, it'll model it for me automatically. Works on terrain. So again, like it comes down to these automation tools and being able to automate stuff very quickly. Um, it does make a difference in terms of being able to just get your work done faster. Um, the, oh, it says that it's on here. Oh, there it is. This one's called Instant Roof, because if you ever have modeled a roof in SketchUp, or any program for that matter, it sucks. Um, just very painful to do. Let's see if this works or it gives me an error. Nope, it's gonna work. There you go, and a roof. Um, these, are, these, these tools are by Chuck Valley. Uh, I have a link. Thank, I'm glad you're all recording this. I know it's a lot of information, um, but this is the SketchUp scripts. It includes cladding. You can make doors and windows, instant fences, roads, whatever it is that you want to do. And that's the key to it. Again, like I've shown you three or four tools like for automation. And that's the secret to doing all this. Like we don't model all the finicky stuff. We just, you know, and that brings up Lumion. <laughs> I'm going to show you something I probably shouldn't share. <laughs> I'm going. We did a survey. I'll just bring this up. So this is what we're doing is testing rendering output without any post-production. So it doesn't matter which render, there's four different rendering programs represented here. And the general consensus has been is who cares? <laughs> so what that means is we use a lot of Lumion. And the reason why we use Lumion is because it's quick, it, it can be really effective. I'll show you some examples of what we've been doing with Lumion and why I would encourage you to, to learn Lumion, Enscape, all of them, but learn some Lumion because most offices at this point and LA firm probably have it. Um, and we've been having fun with what we've been doing with Lumion in terms of, you know, these, these renders for these projects. Um, just playing around with uh, lighting and snow, you know, we import in these lighting objects. Um, this is supposed to be a tram shot, but it really comes down to the creative aspect. And I know I said this again, so I'm repeating myself, but this is more specific in and around Lumion is being able to produce these kind of shots and how you do it. The composition is important. Like there's inside these buildings are billboards that show interiors that we then create an emissive lighting system for it. Um, and then obviously the lighting in itself. Uh, now, the most important thing about Lumion is when we train someone, like we have interns that come into our office or someone who's brand new to SketchUp or even someone who's intermediate, we train everybody first on Lumion because the ratio of learning time is, 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 is 10 to one. So an hour of Lumion versus 20 hours of SketchUp in an hour, you'll know Lumion. And it's encouraging. People get to see their results very quickly and what the end result might be. Um, and the other thing about Lumion is its ability to lay plants down um, and, and, and other aspects. Of it. That's not to rule out Enscape or Twin Motion or Unreal Engine or V-Ray. Um, as I can show you here, like from our point of view, you know, this is what people are generally using in the architectural world are actually nothing. To V-Ray, Twin Motion, Lumion, Enscape, Unreal, Max. D5 is another one that we're using. Um, it's wonderful. Um, there's a whole conversation about rendering in Unreal Engine. It's fairly complicated, but if you're gonna model, learn Lumion. And there's a lot of reasons to learn Lumion is because you don't have to put the vegetation into SketchUp itself. You know, so something like, um, 
Let's go to Kingston. And this is all project work, everything you're seeing here. So well, this will is you a, show a how to with the Lumion with one oh, of yeah, sure. sketches? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Um, while that's loading, because it's going to take a second, um, this is us using a different rendering program. This is us using D5, um, and we're learning to use this program right now because of the technology behind it. Um, so we we're doing part of what we do is this these rendering project tests. So we're keeping ourselves immersed in terms of the different types that are being used. Um, let's see, is Lumion launching? Come on, Lumion. Create new, create an environment. And I'm gonna go import in. So first and foremost, this is literally the UI, UX UI. These are rendering options. So rendering a photo, rendering an animation, saving your file, VR, and then we're in build mode. On the left, you have weather. You'll never touch this really rarely. Ironically enough, you won't use the landscape features at all. Um, so the only other two menus you're gonna use are the content library and materials. The content library is where you spend most of your time. And in this case, I'm gonna import in my SketchUp model. Notice we have a folder structure for the way we work in 3D. CAD, Arial, SketchUp, Lumion, rendering outputs, textures, comments, drones, source, and then whatever other rendering program we might be using. Um, it's a really efficient way for us to um, have consistency across all our platforms. I'll import this in and I'll go slowly on how we actually build this up because it's actually the easier portion of what we do is Lumion. Um, depending on what we're doing, we argue internally about who's doing Lumion versus SketchUp. Really just depends on the project at times though. Oh, hopefully I hit okay. Nope, I did not. Any questions? I think this is great. I think some of the students were, would be really interested in this. Oh, can we have Tim? Hi, Tim. Hi, Daniel. Uh, can you oh, hear me? Yeah. How are you, sir? I'm great. Uh, this has been a really fascinating lecture. Um, I, I'm curious uh, about your thoughts on, on Blender. I know it's not even on the list, but uh, it's free <laughs> and seems kind of powerful. Anyways. Blend Blender's extraordinary. Um, for what it does, uh, especially it's 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 um, the kind of VFX that it actually can produce. Um, but let me uh, uh, let me explain that in more detail. This is my friend. If you could see the website when it pops up, his name is Tom Schultz, and. He's the VFX, lead VFX for Sony. Um, these are all the movies he's worked on. Um, he recently was showing me Guardians of the Galaxy and I work with him on various things. And he uses Blender, he uses Unreal Engine, um, he uses After Effects. And all those are really the top, top kind of programs you can use. I mean, one of the things that he can do that for us right now is kind of is difficult is this is a drone footage with a 3D model in it and it's really fluid um, but it required Unreal Engine, Blender and After Effects to do. And so the problem there is all three of those programs are just very difficult to learn. Blender in particular requires you to have some knowledge of scripting and coding. Um, and then, you know, the expertise. We actually asked Tom if he would train us, like the three of us in our studio. And he's like, I can't train you. It's too hard to learn. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would encourage anybody, if they can learn Blender, they could probably learn anything. Um, but it, I mean, here's another one that's just nice. Like, he's really 
this is something that we're trying to figure out how to do more of. At this point, we're just going to hire him to do it. Um, but I love it because it's just, you know, best way to show anything is in context. Um, so again, Blender, After Effects, and Unreal Engine, um, which is really kind of the process, some of the process he uses for the VFX stuff. He actually has shown me how we work in VFX and psh, I actually am glad I do this, <laughs> to be honest with you, because that stuff's kind of hard. Um, does that help? Yeah. So I guess it's more of an animation program, I guess, than something you'd use like in place of Lumion for rendering. Um, at this point, I mean, I, it, all of them can animate. All of them have the ability to move around and do animatronics on some level. Um, but it's more the complexity and the learning curve around Blender. Uh, gotcha. I know I, all the season, the all the season three D people I know. Everybody, all of us, at some point, try to sit down and learn Blender, and it's just it's it's not economical. How about that? Yeah, gotcha. it is beautiful though. And again, like when it comes to down to render engines, you know, if the future might very well be with Unreal Engine because. So Unreal Engine is developing or has it already. They have a partnership with NVIDIA. Um, they own Twin Motion, and then D5, which I demonstrated to you, uses the Unreal Engine. But no, it's not owned by them. Now, why this is important is because this is infinite model. It doesn't matter how big the textures are. It doesn't matter how big the model is. It completely ignores all that, and you have the ability to now render out. Um, in real time and play video games for the type of CGI that we're seeing on the screen. And they're working on this. This might become ubiquitous. Um, and that's why we're, what we've learned is that a lot of architectural firms are using Enscape for their quick and dirty renders. And then they're using Twin Motion. And they're moving away from V-Ray um, to do the really nice renders. Um, you know, this is somebody learning how to do this for the first time this week out of Twin Motion. Um, you know, when this is Unreal Engine and the rendering here to me on this bottom half is just superb, like out of the box, limited po post-production. So the, uh, the, the, there's, there's a revolution in terms of all this technology being influenced by AI, because what net, what NVIDIA is doing with Unreal is using AI algorithms to actually do all this now. So all the heavy lifting that the CPU used to do is now being run by something, an algorithm. Um, and that's part of the research that I'm doing is trying to figure out the direction of all this, especially because once Apple comes out with their virtual reality glasses, I guarantee you everything changes even more. Really cool. I, Thanks, Daniel. <laughs> sorry, I could talk about this. Oh, all no, day. that's yeah, that's great. Thank you. So here we are, Lumion. Um, and, you know, we'll start by. Oh, so, Daniel, sorry, oh. you, this is the that model you just showed in SketchUp. You just imported it directly into that in Lumion. Yes, I think okay. I have it in here. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. So here's the SketchUp model. Um, and then we import it into Lumion. And on top of it, just, you know, whatever, if we make any changes to the model in SketchUp, I can select this model and I can come over here and I can re-import it. So it'll reload it for me with all the updates and keep the textures. Um, so that's the first thing. And a lot of the rendering programs do this, right? Enscape does it automatically within SketchUp, V-Ray, all of them. Um, Rhino, you can just click and re-import the model as well. Um, and especially because Rhino's got a great system for interpolating between different programs. Um, but then we'll come in here and we'll start adding, you know, vegetation. Everything goes on layers for example, and then we'll come in, let's say we want to put some trees in. I'll click on place, I'll click on nature, and I have my favorites, um, but there's a fairly large tree library. But the nice thing about it is, you know, I can also create pathing for this and I can mask place these. And again, Automation is the key to what we have to do. And that ability is not hard with something like Lumion where I can just start placing all these trees. And I'm being really quick and dirty about this. 
um, and start creating, you know, rich context around here to the point where at this point, some of the project managers and principals that we work for actually go out there, take photos of the trees that are out there and are making us match it, um, you know, extensively accurately. We actually did that for this particular project. Um, and Lumion just has a really good seamless UX and UI. Um, at this point, I've been using it for 12 years, so I'm somewhat habituated to it. That's wrongly or rightly, that might be a bad thing, but at the same time, we are definitely using all these different rendering programs. Um, it's just that our firm is also heavily invested into this. So take it with a grain of salt, but I would encourage it because again, like once you get fast with it, um, you know, we can pretty much produce models in a day. Um, what's a recent one we just did? Yes, Minneapolis. So we did all these renders using the SketchUp Lumion placemaker process in two days. So we did all, this is one park. Um, we did it for, now don't confuse speed with design. <laughs> Um, that's a whole separate conversation. Every once in a while, we model something. Just, again, we did all this. You could see all this stuff. Like there's the, we have to match the photo of the existing, you know, tree canopy in the background, um, get some of the train in there. One of the things that's interesting, and I'll, I'll show you this, about 3D modeling, and I thank you for just letting me lecture on it. Um, is it Schmidt? Yeah. I sent these renders off to one of the principals and he's like, this looks terrible. And I was like, yeah, because the design sucks. <laughs> um, so the design definitely comes across in 3D if it's missing things. And we ended up going back and I was like, you need to rework this. And so we got to a more, you know, amicable level in terms of what this might look like. And these are all Lumion again. Um, you know, playing around with filters, views, lighting, and adjustments. Um, and that's the other aspect of why I would encourage 3D modeling. You get to do a lot of design work. Um, you, you get to be like, here, we have, um, I'll get something like this, and then I have to go model it. Well, there's no information here. So then you get to design it. What does this look like? What does that look like? You get to do the precedent studies as well. Um, sometimes we ask for that. Um, we get to model specialty kind of equipment. Um, it becomes a fun process depending on which project you're working on. Um, and Lumion is key to that, especially because we can go in here and you know add all the bells and whistles. So let's say I want to add a texture to this. Um, I can now go here and I will click on grass. I can go and edit the grass too. Now the problem with, with Lumion is the graphic quality is just okay. Um, but again, like we were recently told internally like to not spend as much time on some of the renderings and to just get them out because they're good enough, which we got into an argument with them because <laughs> I shouldn't have taken that personally and I did. Um, I've never had someone to tell me go backwards on renderings, but that's a little bit of an ego thing on my part. And I just need to shut up and do what I'm told. That's what they want. Um, and that's the way it works. And, and rendering in particular can be a very, you know, touchy thing in an object because everybody's got their perspective on it and everything's valid. You know, there's nothing that's not going to be valid about that. Um, and the other reason why we like using Lumion is because of its ability to actually produce some fairly nice um, effects with all this. So like a typical effects for us, I'll go click the screen. You know, you can adjust the focal length. And then I can go to town on doing different types of lighting. So I'll go to lighting and I'll do real sky. So these are HDRI lighting that you can start adjusting, get some nice sheen on it. And I don't know if anybody remembers Bob Ross, but this is our Bob Ross moment in the office. This is why we kind of fight over who's gonna do this part. 
you know, soft shadows, just the coloring, the brightness. Um, there's so many different kind of um, filters here. You know, you can add a little bit of a hand sketch to it if you want. Um, you can barely see it in that case, very subtle. Um, you can go in there and add a little bit of fog, precipitation if you want to get some little bit of reflectivity even on the ground. Um, of the precipitation phase. So it's adding a little bit of reflection onto the ground. Adjust the camera. I love using tilt shift. It's a great feature um, to just kind of blur out portions in the foreground or in the in the background. Um, I like to add though, I'm the only one who likes, likes to do this, very small amount of just like a paint daub to it. Um, And then obviously you can keep going with the enhancements. We actually spend quite a bit of time on this particular portion of things. Um, we save some of these settings out. Uh, maybe the precipitation is too much, but I'm being picky. You can see the difference right there. And then we can render these out. And when we render these out, you can render these out in really large formats, um, which we do fairly often actually. Um, because it does help in terms of just having a crisper render, which everybody wants. So like, and you know, start adding people in here. You could make the people, uh, you know, walking people. Um, the nice thing about Lumion is that they've worked on a fairly inclusive and diverse kind of a cache of people. And that's actually important because you do need to, we work in a lot of major cities and you do need to be able to uh, convey um, an assortment of different people, um, whatever that might be, uh, you know, whether it's Chinese, Japanese, African American, doesn't matter. Um, and so Lumion gives us quite a bit of all that information. And then on top of it, there's a lighting system in here that's really easy to use. Um, it's fairly effective. Um, and you can see I'm doing all of this real time with you, you know, so it's not a stretch to start going right there from lighting. Um, I could just start popping all these. And this is how we do a lot of our night renders. You know, obviously I'm being very <laughs> loose and goosey here with what I'm trying to do in terms of placing these lights. Um, but you get the idea. Like, you know, now I have, if I want it, I have a night render. Well, it doesn't like that. Here my. Can you add like a context, like a photo context? So it's like the actual buildings from the site or whatever of that nature? Yes, we actually will either go model it or that's what we use Placemaker for um, is to go get the context. But it depends on the project. For some projects, um, we will definitely uh, model that. I'll show you an exa some examples because it really depends on how much time you want to spend on um, actually how much budget you have is one of them. Um, not, not, in, not inconsequential. Here's some global illumination and adds more shadows. You can see that. Um, take the painting filter off. And adjust the clouds and the sky. Some night scenes. So again, like Lumion is this kind of almost all-inclusive um, program that lets you really just have the power of kind of a visual effects studio. And that's nice. Um, it's nice. Um, and again, like it's it's fairly simple to use. Um, and that's where we start. They have some great tutorials on their website for it. Um, that's not to say that these other programs aren't worthwhile. Uh, let me, let's, can we, any questions? I'm going over a lot, I know. We have yeah. a question. Evan, do you have a question? 
Yeah, um, this is great. Thank you so much for this. Um, I've used Lumion a little bit before in the past, and I've always found that when I am ready to render, it takes a lot of time to now render. Is that just a time management issue, or is there other quicker ways to like get a final product of your render? So with, with Lumion, and one of the disadvantages of it is you really do need a powerful graphics card. Um, right. You know, it comes down to, you know, and for us, we're in a digital studio. We also use our these computers to process drone data. Um, so I have a maxed out computer, uh, maxed out CPU, maxed out RAM. So you do need the investment into a good, at the base, you need a good GPU for it. Otherwise, I'd use Enscape, but even then, like, if you're throwing in a lot of vegetation, I'd be very cognizant also on the top right here, if you're using Lumion and you start seeing this turning red, <laughs> then you know you're, 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 you're overloading your system requirements. And then you should be able to do a benchmark on it as well. Have you been able to do that? Um, not exactly at the moment. Um... So if you go to save and load projects, there's a benchmark test here. Right. Um, so you could see I'm maxed out. Okay, yes. <laughs> so you'll see where, you know, the minimal requirements are. Um, but yeah, and I know that's a challenge. Like, uh, you know, at this point, if you're, if you're doing modeling, you need a gaming system, like I buy power or something, $1,500 with just as good of a GPU as you can get. Um, there is a benchmark website, uh, GPU benchmarks what is this yeah there it is so right the geforce rtx just came out <laughs> that's the rendering quality it's ridiculous i am using this one so anything for lumion you really want anything on this almost on this page even this you know that's a good card the GPU technology is just, it's changing quickly too. And that has a lot to do with the AI stuff, um, which I'm gonna talk about next, if that's okay. Okay to talk about AI? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh -huh. uh, so last year, my bosses came up to me and said, we went to a presentation. We're giving you a budget to determine if we're gonna lose our jobs to AI. I was like, sure, fair game. Um, so this was a year ago and I hired a coder and we went out and we researched AI. What we discovered about AI is that to get to the point of where we are now with something like Dolly or Mid Journey or ChatGPT or Bard or whatever one, there's so much AI, like. It took the collective resources of the entire planet to get there. I don't know how to describe that other than to say like it was monumental and it took decades. Like we're reaping the fruits of it now and it's not going to go away. Seth Godin, I don't know if you know who he is, he said it like AI is going to become ubiquitous in our lives for better or for worse. Um, I wouldn't want to be a graphic designer. Um, personally, at our firm, we will not use Dolly or Midjourney because of the fact that they really do need to figure out the copyrights with that. Um, and that's an internal dis discussion that a lot of firms are in fact having. Um, I do use ChatGPT. I've had some fairly extensive conversations with ChatGPT over the past while, um, you know, including, uh, anywhere from religion to the most interesting part was it redid my bio and it actually did a pretty good, it did a pretty good, I, uh, pretty good bio for me. Um, I asked it questions about distributed rendering network. Um, I would basically say this is worth playing around with. I, and only because you need to familiarize yourself with AI. Um, but let me show you something more practical about AI in terms of what's going on. And that's the computer vision learning part. Um, so again, like I, I, in the remote sensing world, and what remote sensing is, is this gathering of aerial site data, um, 
through various means. Uh, it, you know, it was really popularized with the Landsat satellites that were used during the Cold War. If you're following what's going on in Ukraine, like it really is a drone remote sensing war because it's all about understanding where an analysis of what's going on. Well, computer vision has been around for, you know, since the early 2000s. And it's what, you know, this is an example of how a car with AI, computer vision for assessing road conditions, looks at the world. Um, and computer vision AI works off a very simple process. It's, it identifies an object. Oh, that's a bike. It classifies the bike, the object. Oh, if that's a bike, then it belongs to this group. And then it, the hardest part, and they haven't figured it out, which is where driverless cars are hitting a, a, a road bump, no pun intended, is classification, um, is segmentation, which is what you all do in Photoshop when you create outlines. And the computer doesn't really know what that is. But that technology is still amazing. So there's a company called Ecopia out of Toronto, um, Ecopia Tech. And they're not the only ones doing this anymore, but they're basically taking high resolution aerials and they're producing nine centimeter survey. And not only is this survey, like this is a survey on steroids. Um, it shows you bollards, it'll show you parking stripes, it'll show you crosswalks, it'll show you pedestrian lights. You can then get all that information. This is two square miles, two kilometers of downtown Atlanta that we got from Ecopia um, for two grand. Um, and that's the future of what's gonna happen with this data as well um, is between the drones having AI, the ability for these companies to gather data, and it's a thing, um, and then disseminated to us is huge. So we actually tried it out. We flew a project site with a drone. We took the aerial and sent it to Ecopia and they provided us with a CAD drawing um, for $30 um, versus having somebody, we're gonna go capture the drone data anyway. It would be great to have a seven or nine centimeter accurate survey for this. I mean, it, the AI was able to produce orthogonal lines for buildings and a cohesive network. And it broke down we paid a limit, we paid the smallest amount to get the minimal information. If we paid more, we would have gotten more information. Um, so that's one aspect of where computer vision is starting to disrupt uh, the data technology side. If you go to Europe, if you go to the Scandinavian countries in particular, they already have this data available for free for everybody to download. Um, and that's you know the socialist model in terms of wanting to collect that data for the for the societal contract, and then disseminating it out. The United States were a very large company. A uh, company. <laughs> that's a Freudian slip. The United States is a very large country. So is Canada by sheer size, right? You're bigger than us. So it, it's not as easy to centralize that information, which is why it's all dispersed. Um, and. But at the same time, you're gonna see more and more of these. There's one company out of Boulder, they have a fleet of 500 single of planes that are flying in various cities every day, just collecting data. Um, you know, and then, you know, how that works in terms of building all these different sites, for example, like talking about context, it's, it's pulling that pieces of data, the aerials, you know, here's the master plan they gave us using uh, urban paint to create the automated uh, framework for the uh, roads, um, using our custom building models to actually create all these custom, you know, existing conditions, you know. So again, it comes down to the library and resources you have. Um, and then you start rendering it out and adding the detail and the context to it. Um, but a big portion of this is the remote data is all that information that we can pull and then recreate them. And that's what we do as landscape architects. And that's why it's kind of exciting to be in LA right now. Like when I went to school I, back in the day, when I walked up to the school, both ways in the snow, <laughs> whatever, um, I didn't use a computer. I only started using a computer once I got out of school. Um, and I was using Mylar and double stick tape and, you know, pens. We didn't have these capabilities. Um, and these capabilities are now shaping the future of how we're all practicing. Again, it doesn't matter which 3D program you want to use, how you want to render. 
it's understanding the technical aspects of all these different pieces and how they actually impact us. It's not for everybody. Um, not everybody needs to be a, a technology maven, um, but it's good to know what's going on. Um, and again, I can keep lecturing about this stuff ad infinitum all day. And because my job is to be immersed in understanding it. And, you know, I'm successful at what I do, but it's actually, I won't lie, there's a bit of desperation in making sure to maintain a level of relevance because this technology changes so quickly um, and there's so much going on, especially with AI. Um, so yes, familiarize yourself with AI. Use Dolly, use ChatGPT and, and keep it in the background. Here's another example of being able to pull data for 10 square miles in downtown Denver, or I'm sorry, in the Denver Tech Center, finding the buildings that we can pull, um, you know, some of the research aspect and creating context. Um, whew, that was a lot. Any questions on all this? <laughs> A lot of information. I know. That's so, that's fantastic. Any questions at this point? Okay, Graham. Graham has his hand up here. Hello, Daniel. Hello. Um, earlier, you mentioned that you were hired to, like, in in your firm, to figure out if we're going to lose lose our jobs to AI in some respect or your jobs, at least. Um, have you had any like conclusive answers to that yet? Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't finish that thought, did I? <laughs> um, <laughs> So no, we're not. Um, to break it down first, we wanted to see if, well, can you teach these computers to model in 3D? No, the minute a computer has to figure out Z, game over. It's the number of calculations to connect things in three dimensional space, it goes down to physics, which is what, you know, uh, you, you can't really measure an object, how fast it's going in its position in space and vice versa, whatever. Um, will it get there? Yes. Um, design, I mean, I've studied generative design. Um, I gave a presentation on generative design where Autodesk was using planning terms, uh, region, uh, city, uh, plaza, to define the elements of, a, of an internal layout for a building program. And it was able to come up with hundreds of concepts based off these criteria and and refine it and learn from it um but that was several years ago and it hasn't really progressed yet and i don't think it will like design is such a human endeavor you can definitely feed a computer all this information but i and create pretty pictures and things that are aesthetic and composed to capture the, nece the necessity of what um, is really required to create good spaces or uh, understand environmental needs um, or climate change. Um, I see it more as a tool that will assist us. Um, I actually can, I have something, if I can find it. Um, is it? I just have way too many presentations. I'm sorry. I don't even know what this one is. Yeah, this is some examples of drone work and it's not even the best, but you know, going and capturing features and then incorporating it in. Um, <laughs> yeah, did some research on Apple VR. Yeah, there's, oh, I don't have it. So for example, on the iPad, the SketchUp iPad, you can train it where you draw a circle and it'll model a circle. Their goal is that you'll be able to eventually on the iPad in SketchUp trace something and it's just gonna model it. And they're already doing it with AI. There's one feature where if you're modeling a table, SketchUp will make suggestions for different types of tables. And then you click on it, it'll import it in. So, assisted, assisted, for right now, assisted. Um, you know, ChatGPT can write code. I actually wrote some code with it. I don't write code. I hire people to write code. But ChatGPT could write code. Not well, not yet. Will it replace coders? Maybe, um, I don't know. It is worth paying attention because the fact that it's gonna be ubiquitous and part of our lives and everywhere, uh, you know, I mean, here's Dolly or one of version of something that was like that. Um, I've spent hours, you know, if you're a graphic designer, 
yeah, maybe be concerned, but again, we'll see. I don't know. I don't know fully. I can't say with certainty that it's not going to completely impede us. The jury's out. Um, but it's as of right now, you know, your brain is much more powerful than these language learning models. And they're not sentient. Whatever anyone wants to think, they're not. I went through the route of thinking they were and then delved into the research. And then it, it really isn't. Um, it's it can fake it. It can definitely pass the Turing test <laughs> at this point, but that's not a useful test anymore. That was the long-winded answer. Sorry. No, I appreciate it because the way that I'm sort of understanding it is it's like there is a limit to its capacity right now. And it's like to the point where, yes, you do need a human rationale to make good decisions, essentially. You know, one of the best lines in Star Wars was if drones were any smarter, they wouldn't need any of us. And so the premise in Star Wars was really that the capacity for AI is limited. Um, and that's also, you know, something we don't talk about. Like there's a difference between general AI, which is the AI that would be conscious. Um, and then, you know, specific AI, which is chat GPT. Part of my hobbies is studying physics. Um, and Roger Pimrose, famous physicist, basically is saying that consciousness in humans is somehow entangled in quantum entanglement. And they've actually found some evidence that the microtubules in our brains are actually entangled in some way. What they're entangled with? Great question. Nobody knows. But there's a process to consciousness that we don't fully understand. And, and we can't replicate that. So whatever these things are, um, they're going to, I mean, you're going to need it to, you're going to see more and more of these things coming out where they're just going to be like, let me help you schedule your, 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 your laundry, uh, your, your whatever, or here, I took a picture of what's in our fridge. Here's some recommended recipes based on what you have. Like that's already could be coded and is already being done. Um, you know, generative design is an interesting thing to actually understand because they are doing things that are pushing the limits in terms of being able to create all these different you know, it's in here someplace. Yeah, here it is. So this is what Autodesk did as an example of generative design for a floor layout plan. And that's AI driven. But this was a while ago and it really hasn't popped. So again, you need the human, you need the human. Um, I'm going to talk about AR VR less next to just kind of, you know, really talk about this because I know this is a big deal. So you could see my screen, right? Pick your poison. And, I, and maybe talk about the difference between AR and VR too. Okay. So AR is augmented reality, VR is uh, uh, virtual reality. Um, augmented reality, is what we all really want. At least I do, because basically, you know, if you're already using Pokemon on the go, um, but really it is the ability to, you know, interact with the real world while you're interacting with a digital world. Um, I know that HP or Lenovo's recent head VR actually has a camera on it where you can turn it on and see the external world. Um, but the problem has been, you know, for someone like me, I put one of these on and I'm that pumpkin. You know, you're not going to go to a public meeting, especially after COVID, and start telling people to put headgear on their, you know, stuff on their head. Um, so, you know, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> you, this is the Newton. This was developed by Apple in 1984. And it's a touch screen. Now, it didn't work because what were you connecting to? There was no internet, there was no apps, but basically they came up with the notion of the phone that we all use now 35 years ago, however long ago that is. Um, you know, now you have Steve Jobs with the, you know, here's the app iPhone one and everything changed. What we're, this is an active conversation and part of the research that we're doing is Apple VR, Apple AR. 
Why? Because Apple has not jumped into this game till now and they waited because Apple is brilliant at solving the UX UI interface problems and the, and the VR AR virtual reality where you're immersed in AR, where it's mixed reality, you're seeing reality in your real world plus digital information. It just sucks. Like either you're tethered or you're nauseous. Um, by all accounts, it was supposed to come out in January, 2023. It's now delayed till September, hopefully. But from what people are saying in the industry, like this was, it's going to be as revolutionary as our phones. And let me explain what that means, because this is also part of it. The, the iPad and now these kind of iPhones and stuff, they have very powerful integrated CPUs and GPUs. So they're combining the CPU, the GPU for really powerful outputs. The goal for Apple is to make sure that your phone sits in your pocket and you no longer use it, and that you're walking around with a watch and glasses to interact with the world and your digital data. And what that means for just, let's say, for our segment of the 3D visualization world means that we have to plan for people being able to see augmented reality of our projects in the real world. Um, and this is no small thing because first Apple's going to release the VR headset and then a year later, whenever they're doing that, they're releasing the AR headset. And do not be surprised if it comes with little things on your fingers where you can now start, you know, I thought people were you know, schizophrenic walking around talking on their phones and you don't see them talking to anything. Wait till we all start walking around wiggling our fingers. Um, and it's, it's going to happen. Um, so that's another thing to consider in terms of the world in technology that's about to kind of descend upon us. Um, because, you know, it hasn't, you know, it hasn't materialized for us. And if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be Apple. Um, I, I actually actively have conversations with, you know, the people that are running some of these visualization companies, and that's the primary things they're all waiting for is to see what Apple does. So we don't do this anymore. Um, is there more stuff? Yeah, there's always more to talk about. Here's another example of drone work where we use the drone work to scan and create point clouds of as-built. So we'll go out there after the project's done and we'll scan it because then we have a digital measurement of it. Um, I didn't go into all the nuances of drone work, but every time I do that, I, I think I end up hurting somebody's head, including my own. Um, and again, doing a lot of R&D and testing. This was a roadmap for the kind of R&D work that we're doing. Um, so yeah, uh, I would encourage all of you to go to my website. And if you want any of the extensions that I talked about other than Placemaker, I can help you get a license for Placemaker. I can't give you credits, though. Um, I'll give you Urban Paint and some of these other things that we talked about. So just reach out to me. Um, and, and my goal is to help students as much as we can. Um, it's a small profession, again, and, and it, it needs the support. Um, and I owe a lot back to it, honestly. Um, here's just one last thing I'll end with is I, I would encourage you also to do night renders. It's a really good way to develop a stylistic quality and kind of differentiate yourself. Um, and that's something that we're doing uh, heavily within our firm um, and trying to encourage it. Um, but thank you for the time. And if you've got questions, uh, yeah, let me know. Yeah, th this is fantastic. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, maybe can you put in the chat like um, the urban paint and some of those stuff too students can look at and then they could contact you as well i'm just going to put the download link for urban paint and the website for it excellent thank you if i could find it <laughs> where did i put this oh my goodness see this is where i would be like computer help me find <laughs> help me do my taxes Ooh, you see that's another one they're going to help us do our taxes. God, that's going to be great. Oh, why won't it let me? Yeah, I'll have to send it. Oh, it's because it's not. Okay. It's going to be fun.